Shifting gears to hereditary cancer testing, a recent ASCO paper highlighted the importance of germline testing, even for people that have been previously tested with somatic testing. So um, Jerome, I was interested in hearing if you could kind of discuss the potential effects of these guidelines on testing and whether it will lead to greater adoption and where do you think that this adoption will occur in the decentralized, centralized or both? I think you're on mute, Jerome. It does work better when it's not muted, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, I do see a lot of positive effects of universal germline testing. Um, you know, it's, you know, a lot of people aren't aware that there's universal, you know, testing recommendations for affected patients, patients with a cancer diagnosis in colorectal cancer, ovarian, uh, pancreatic, um, breast just recently, you know, expanded their criteria um, to essentially be universal testing and also prostate cancer. And what that means is greater access for cancer patients to determine if their cancer is genetically driven. Um, if we think about more cancer patients receiving hereditary cancer testing, as a result, we can find um, in those patients who have a pathogenic variant, we can also test their first degree relatives to find those who may also carry a pathogenic variant and get them into a screening program to prevent the cancer diagnosis. Um, you know, taking a step back, the goal of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, which we don't hear a lot about anymore, but when it was relaunched in 2022, um, the goal was to reduce the cancer death rate by 25% in the next 25 years. And, you know, the best way to do that is to gain a deeper understanding of these germline genetic, you know, germline driven cancers and identify that cohort of patients of healthy people who are at the highest risk. So another positive uh, effect is we can drive routinization of point of care hereditary cancer testing for affected patients. Um, one of the big bottlenecks for market access, even though criteria has expanded, even though market access has expanded, is there's not enough genetic counselors. Uh, but if we can, you know, create you know, workflow systems and greater education of providers, we can cut down on the time it takes for a patient to be consented and tested because today it's very common for cancer patients to wait, you know, three to six months, in some cases more, after curative therapy for an appointment with a genetic counselor, simply for that GC2 to explain to them what hereditary cancer testing is. And again, that's unacceptable when, you know, these cancer patients are in and out of the clinic almost on a weekly basis for the greater part of six months being, you know, treated, um, you know, for their cancer. So um, this is also, uh, you know, a big, you know, platform or um, for me is, is eliminating healthcare disparities. Um, this universal testing, increased access for patients with a cancer diagnosis is extremely important for underrepresented pop populations because the attrition rate of patients who um, are referred to GC services and who ultimately don't make, you know, that appointment is around 50%. And if we think about, you know, these patients who are not in urban centers, who may be on Medicaid, have no insurance, or underinsured, you know, middle class families who are just underinsured, that means another trip to the doctor that they have to plan for. And you know what, none of these patients, you know, go to the doctors them by themselves, they usually have somebody else with them. So they got to coordinate this trip with someone else. Um, it can mean another missed day of work and missed wages that some just cannot afford to do. Um, for goodness sakes, depending on where you live, it means more money to park. You know, how many how many guys have tried to park in downtown Chicago or New York? I mean, that's that's a deterrent in itself. So, you know, all that said, of all these positive effects, I don't at all see germline testing becoming decentralized. Um, there are, you know, far too many, you know, guidelines and quality measures, you know, from the FDA. The, the tests that are clinically actionable uh, from a hereditary cancer, you know, testing guideline, you know, we believe that test is one and done, but it's not. There are new variants being detected all the time. And one, you have to have the, the level of expertise to, you know, uh, to interpret those variants. 
uh, you got to keep up with ClinVar because, you know, VUSs uh, over time it may be benign or they may be pathogenic. And you got to reclassify those and reach back out to these patients over time to let them know that, that, that you know, variant of unknown significance is now you know, pathogenic and direct them accordingly. And, you know, not to mention, that means a change in the assay when new variants need to be added, which is now, if you're going to change your assay, <laughs> the first consideration for changing and updating in that assay has got to be your FDA path for approval. So um, I don't see at all the ability of hereditary uh, cancer testing or for rare disease germline genetic testing uh, having the possibility of being decentralized, especially when you know these healthcare systems are operating on razor thin margins. It is a it is a huge task, and there are very few centralized labs who can do uh, germline you know genetic testing uh, at that level as well for the same reasons.